So, Janine, I have a really cool fact for you. And of all things, it's actually about Warfarin. Wait, is this like a cool, cool fact, Steve, or a nerdy cool fact? That's totally a cool, cool fact fact Uh uh-huh well if it's about how warfarin was named after the wisconsin alumni research foundation i've heard that one before probably from marty freed actually no janine that's old news because marty's already tried to convince me that bucky the badger came up with it (laughs) no this is about warfarin dosing did you know that you actually don't need to dose it at night wait really you mean all those default order sets i put in as a resident were totally wrong well not wrong wrong but kind of wrong it's kind of overkill okay stop but before we talk any more about warfarin, we should really slow down. With all these DOACs out now, I feel like med students these days rarely see warfarin anymore. Yeah, but don't worry, Janine. I'm well prepared. I was just at SHM and they had a workshop for how to teach millennials medicine. And well, we recognize that a lot of you guys out there are millennials. Actually, we are too, Steve. Wait, what? I mean, technically. So you're telling me I learned how to teach myself. Yes. <laughs> Super meta. Okay, Perfect is- for you. So just so your mind doesn't explode any further... Let's move on. In today's episode, we're going to cover why we prescribe certain medications in the morning or at night. First, we're going to try to cover the pharmacodynamics of warfarin and why you don't necessarily need to dose it at nighttime, but maybe your patient should still take it the same time every day. And two, we'll cover antihypertensive medications. What's all this data suggesting that it's actually better to take them at night? And three, but we're actually going to save points three and four for the next episode, statins. Why do we have to dose those at night, and is it that important? And four, what's the impact of all of this on the patient? Does taking meds at night help with adherence or hurt it? So, in the words of Ray Charles, is the nighttime really the right time? You're quoting music again, Steve. I can't handle that. It's a good song, though. (laughs) So, let's take a deeper dive on why we have our patients take their medications night and day, night and day. I can't. I can't take it. Let's move on. Hi, I'm Janine Knudsen. And I'm Steve Liu. Welcome to Mind the Gap. A core I am podcast. We'd like to thank Dr. Matthew Sparks, esteemed nephrologist at Duke, and Tanya Ahuja, one of our favorite pharmacists at NYU Langone Health, for peer reviewing this episode. Please subscribe to our show notes at coreimpodcast.com. And don't forget to follow us on Insta and Twitter. Let's get back to tackling warfarin. Let's talk about why doesn't it matter if you dose it in morning or at night? Okay, so Steve, you really have to convince me here. I've been dosing it at night for years. Well, that's not a very good reason to do it, Janine. <laughs> You're right. <laughs> The thing is, there is no real clinical outcome data to support taking it at night. It's not even mentioned in the HA guidelines. And yet, most anticoagulation clinics and hospital systems recommend nightly warfarin. Wait, that's our teaching point? That there's just no data at all? Give me at least one paper, Steve. Just one. We're doing a podcast on evidence-based medicine. There's really not good data. (laughs) But if you want something, I guess there's at least a couple of places that mention it. There's a study protocol and the Cleveland Clinic website, both saying that we mainly do it actually help providers. Are you serious? That's not convincing me a lot. Yeah, you know, but there is some utility to that. Okay, so since inpatient labs are done in the morning, that gives providers all day to adjust the warfarin dose because it's given at night. If it were given in the morning instead, by the time you get the INR results, it's too late to change that day's dose. In the event that you need to do a procedure, say, inpatient, where I work, if your patient's going to take their warfarin in the morning, there's a chance their INR is going to be higher by the afternoon. So then you're going to have to recheck it and maybe even give vitamin K. Taking it at night and measuring their troughs in the morning gets rid of a lot of those concerns. And that is the best, worst explanation for why we do what we do that I've heard so far. That's fair. But I'll take it. And I guess that explains why anticoagulation clinics do it that way too in the outpatient setting. It's just easier. Yeah. And... If you look at the warfarin pharmacodynamics, it kind of gets a little dumber than that. So, Janine, if I can convince you even less, <laughs> let's take a look at the pharmacodynamics of warfarin. Okay. So, data shows that its half-life is estimated to be between 20 and 60 hours, so really long. And even more, it takes six to eight days to reach a stable therapeutic dose. And so implied in all of this is it really doesn't matter what time of day you're taking it because it's going to have plateau effects, not these big spikes all over the place. Okay. That's in an ideal world. But doesn't warfarin have a small spike in the first few hours after you take it, after it goes through that first past metabolism in the liver. Some researchers think that if you take it at nighttime, when you're eating the most vegetables and therefore the most vitamin K of the day, that timing those two together might be helpful. Okay, just to repeat, what you're saying is that you're timing your little mini INR spike with your vitamin K spike, like an insulin bolus to match your sugar? That's a great analogy, Janine. I got it from someone smart. 
<laughs> it's pretty hypothetical. And that's at least the pharmacologic argument for taking it at night. The study protocol we mentioned earlier actually studies that specifically. It's cleverly named the INR range trial. In range. Nice, right? So bad, but so good. So they're looking at whether or not patients should be taking warfarin in the morning or at night. They're trying to challenge whether this vitamin K idea really matters. So they've reported their data collection has been completed on the clinical trials website. So we're all just going to have to eagerly await their findings. Okay, obviously, Steve, this is going to be at the top of our collective reading list in the coming year. I'm checking my Twitter feed every second. But (laughs) so for now, we're just going to have to go with basic pharmacodynamics and acknowledge that there's a kind of lack of data to make our recommendation, which is that warfarin can probably be taken at any time of the day, as long as it's around the same time every day. Amazing. Consider me convinced with that interesting review of the data, Steve. But at least I'm going to tell all my clinic patients on warfarin that they should take their warfarin at the same time every day, but night or day, whichever is most convenient for them. As long as they're taking it. Exactly. All right. So let's take a look at our next medication to tackle, which is antihypertensives. So here we're going to explore the so-called dipping phenomena and the data behind reducing mortality by prescribing, of all things, blood pressure medications at night. Whoa, hypertension and blood pressure? Those are some weighty topics. Yeah, spoken like a true primary care physician. (laughs) You got me. (laughs) I pulled out an ancient textbook. Whoa, a book? Yeah, it's called The Principles of Ambulatory Medicine. For millennials, books are things we used to read back in the day to learn knowledge. (laughs) We need to tone that down, Steve. (laughs) Also, this book was published in 2003, so really not that long ago. Yeah, but covered in dust. (laughs) Anyway, I didn't really find that much. Maybe that's because I didn't have my control left to help me find it, but... (laughs) Okay, yeah, I guess I agree with you that digital is better for that one. It kind of is. But I did manage to find a section where they noted, in quotes, the lowest blood pressure occurs during sleep, which they pulled from a Lancet paper in 1978. Okay, I didn't need a textbook to tell me that. If you've ever been the night resident feeling calls about low blood pressures at night, you know that this happens. Fair enough. Let's still rewind back to 1978. Three scientists in England did what any self-respecting doctor researching hypertension would do. They got five healthy patients and 20 patients with untreated hypertension and put left brachial A-lines into them and and just sent them out into the world and said, you do you. But they were English, so it's it's probably all proper, like, jolly good old man, go about your day. (laughs) Exactly. That's what they sound like. Yes. Yes. Uh (laughs) And so these 25 people did go about their day, including going to work. But let's remember, they had freaking A-lines in their arms. And the doctors recorded the results. And this was for two days. This is kind of crazy. This was done with informed consent and somehow approved by a hospital ethics committee. Thank you to those brave volunteers because what they also found was that there's interestingly enough a clear dip in both heart rate and blood pressure measurements at night followed by a clear rise in the morning that remains actually relatively stable throughout the day. I don't understand why they didn't just use blood pressure cuffs. Because these guys were crazy, (laughs) Janine. Just very enthusiastic. Yeah, that's a nice way of saying it. (laughs) They noted reasonably that this mimics the rise of catecholamines in the body in the early morning hours. And those also peak by midday. Okay, and physiologically, that makes sense. But I would say this actually doesn't explain why we tell people to take antihypertensives at night. Based off of your observation and theirs, you would think that you should take your blood pressure meds in the morning. These doctors would have agreed with you because in their paper, they note that, quote, it seems that from 6 a.m. until 9 a.m., when the arterial blood pressure is increasing rapidly, active hypotensive therapy is crucial. Perhaps it should be designed to give a more satisfactory blood pressure control during that part of the day. And so this is where dipping comes in. Later evaluations of populations of hypertensive patients noted that in some patients, particularly the elderly and folks with autonomic failure, you actually don't see a drop in blood pressure. So a group of Irish doctors led by Dr. Owen O'Brien coined the term dippers and non-dippers to describe both these groups of patients. So Dr. O'Brien eventually went on to join and lead the European Society of Hypertension's working group on blood pressure monitoring. And get this, he coined even more language. He included dippers and non-dippers, but also reverse dippers and extreme dippers. So we're going to try and parse through all that. To start, dippers, what we would call normal folks, have at least a 10% drop in blood pressures from daytime to nighttime. But then there's the non-dippers, and unlike their name suggests, they actually can also dip. No. Yeah, but only between 0 and 10%. All right. Well, extreme dippers dip more than 20% at night. And then, last but not least, we have the reverse dippers. I would call them risers. No, no, don't be silly, Steve. That would be stupid. These guys are reverse dippers. (laughs) Okay. 
fine. Another accepted term is inverted dipping. That seems very specific. <laughs> so you're saying as their blood pressure reverse dips upwards? Yes, exactly. Their blood pressure is higher at nighttime. So we swear this naming scheme is a real thing. And I guess it kind of makes sense because every specialty is going to have its special vocab. And it turns out hypertension is no different. So what types of patients are in this abnormal category of non-dipping at night? So the folks you're going to see there are people with diabetes, coronary disease, hyperlipidemia, you know, the usual suspects. But there's also a category of people where we're probably just not measuring it right. For example, patients with abnormal sleep habits like teenagers teenagers or Mediterranean people who take a siesta. That's fair. You want to make sure you're not misdiagnosing just because their sleep schedule is a little different. But wait, okay, why do we care so much about dipping again? There's a clear correlation between worsening cardiovascular prognosis and people that don't have normal dipping at night. Yeah, actually from one meta-analysis, there was a 2.5-fold increase in both non-fatal and fatal cardiovascular events in the reverse dippers compared to the regular dippers. And as it turns out, reverse dipping is also worse than non-dipping. Again, that's when the blood pressure just stays the same at night or dips less than 10%. So in that comparison, reverse dippers still had a 2.1 fold increase in poor outcomes over non-dippers. I think by now you all see where we're going with this. Clearly people that don't dip do worse. Gotta dip. <laughs> Just remember that failure to dip probably correlates to other dysregulation. And so it's probably a sign, not necessarily purely a cause of disease. So all this population level data led researchers to ask, does giving antihypertensives at nighttime, so it's peak effect, recreate that dipping effect, does that actually help with mortality? And so they did that in a study called MAPEC, which actually suggests it might. This trial prospectively looked at about 2,100 people with either untreated hypertension or resistant hypertension. They wanted to see if ambulatory blood pressure monitoring and actigraphs, this is a device worn on the wrist that monitors physical activity. Okay, so like a Fitbit? Well, it's definitely not a freaking A-line anyway. <laughs> and so they looked at the difference between dippers versus non-dippers in blood pressure and activity. They gave participants the task of changing at least one of their blood pressure meds to a nighttime dose. Couple caveats. The allocation was random randomized, but the trial wasn't blinded. And they looked at a combined primary outcome of death from all causes, MI, angina, coronary revascularization, heart failure, acute arterial occlusion of the lower extremities, rupture of aortic aneurysms, thrombotic occlusion of the retinal artery, hemorrhagic stroke, ischemic stroke, and TIA. Wow. That's a lot of reading there, Janine. Thanks. So we've warned you guys about combined primary outcomes before. Essentially, what they were looking at here was cardiovascular events, including all-cause mortality. Okay, why, why'd you give me that line, Steve? I appreciate you reading it, though. Yeah, so if you had to summarize their biggest finding, how would you summarize it, Steve? I'll give it a shot. To start, they demonstrated that there was a clear improvement in blood pressures, not only throughout the day, but most specifically at nighttime. Makes sense. Patients who were previously non-dippers became dippers. And related to this, they found that there was a pretty big decrease in their primary outcome of cerebrovascular events and heart failure. They showed a general improvement in all outcomes, actually, but cerebrovascular events and heart failure were statistically significant. After adjusting for sex, age, and diabetes, they found a relative risk reduction of 0.33 in the intervention group. Wow. Well, there is one pretty satisfying data point in favor of taking meds at night, if I've ever seen one. Well, hold your horses there, Janine. I can tell how excited you are. <laughs> So There's campy. one gigantic caveat to this trial. They didn't ensure that all patients were treated with the standardized protocol when it came to medications that we know treat cardiac risk, namely aspirin and statins. Okay, well, that's concerning because that could easily be a confounder. If patients aren't taking aspirin and statins, maybe they have worse outcomes just because of that or vice versa, not related to the blood pressure meds. I agree. And that I feel like could have made a big difference. You know, actually, if you look at their average patient and you plug them into the ASCVD risk score, you end up with a borderline 7.4% risk of ASCVD outcomes at 10 years. Most patients would have qualified for at least a moderate intensity statin. And current guidelines suggest consideration of aspirin too. And so if we're not sure what providers did, we got to question a little bit of their data. But this doesn't necessarily invalidate their findings. We probably would just want to check other places first. So we did look at other trials and the answer remains, as you may guess, it's just not that clear. One of those trials was the Harmony trial. This was published in Hypertension in 2018 and argued against the data presented in MAPEC. The Harmony trial looked at daytime and nighttime dosing as well and argued that nighttime dosing is not actually better. 
So this was a far smaller trial with just over 100 participants. They did a crossover design to look at whether dosing medications at nighttime versus at day for about 12 weeks impacted mean blood pressure readings. So what they found was that it didn't affect blood pressure readings in the daytime and nighttime or over 24 hours. This contradicts the MAPEC finding that mean blood pressure is improved with taking at least one medication at night. And interestingly enough, they also contradicted the data that there was any change in nighttime BP control. In other words, there was wasn't restoration of the dip. But unfortunately, this trial didn't look at cardiovascular outcomes. It wasn't big enough and it didn't go for long enough. And for that, we'll have to wait for the treatment in the morning versus evening trial. Or the aptly named time trial. Ray Charles will be proud. (laughs) And that will show us if the data from MAPEC can be replicated or not. That's actually all we have for today. You guys may have noticed that we haven't talked about the practicality of taking meds at nighttime, but we figured we'd address that the next time when we talk about the use of statins at night. So, Janine, let's summarize. Take it away. Thanks, Steve. We've had a few points. For warfarin, the biggest takeaway is that there's just no data to support nighttime dosing, and the long half-life of the drug makes timing of the dose particularly irrelevant. Ultimately, the timing is based on the needs of the medical team, which you could argue isn't better for patients. So we'll have to wait for the in-range trial data to see where we come out on all of this. But for blood pressure meds, taking them at night may actually have a huge impact on morbidity and mortality. At least that's what the folks in the MAPEC trial suggested. They claim that Dippers, people with nighttime BPs that drop more than 10% than their daytime BPs, have lower cardiovascular disease and mortality. Reverse dippers are more than two times likely to have cardiovascular disease and death. And as the MAPEC trial suggests, taking blood pressure meds at night can restore this dipping effect in non-dippers, commonly patients with diabetes, OSA, hyperlipidemia, and may lead to reduced mortality and cardiovascular disease. Let's not run off with the MAPEC trial just yet, because they didn't control for aspirin or statin use, and a lot of folks that were in their trial probably could have been on those meds. Major confounder. Also, the Harmony trial had opposite results to the MAPEC trial, but it was small, not randomized, and only looked at blood pressure, not mortality. So the jury is definitely still out. But maybe you use a little bit of what Mapex said and you switch one of your BP meds to nighttime if you think you have a patient that can handle it and might be a non-dipper. AKA those with diabetes, OSA, etc. Sounds good. At least that's what some cardiologists and some nephrologists do. So tell us, what do you do? Tweet us or share with us on Insta and let's try to learn from each other's practice. If you enjoyed listening to our show, give us a review on iTunes or whatever podcast app that you use. It helps other people find us and lets us know how we're doing. So follow us on Twitter, Instagram, or Facebook. You can also send an email to hello at coraimpodcast.com, all one gigantic word. As always, opinions expressed in this podcast are our own and do not represent the opinions of any affiliated institution. Do not use this podcast for medical advice. Instead, see your own healthcare provider for medical care. I'm going to tell all my clinic patients on warfarin that they should take their warfarin at the same time every day, night or day. You got it, Janine. Whichever is most convenient. Shut up, Steve. (laughs) Do that line again. (laughs) I'm including the shut up, Steve, in there. No. (laughs) You can't. You can't. I mean, professionalism. Okay. When you need mealtime inspiration, it's worth Shopping Kroger, where you'll find over 30,000 mouth-watering choices that excite your inner foodie. And no matter what tasty choice you make, you'll enjoy our everyday low prices, plus extra ways to save, like digital coupons worth over $600 each week. You can also save up to $1 off per gallon at the pump with fuel points. More savings and more inspiring flavors make Shopping Kroger worth it every time. Kroger, fresh for everyone. Fuel restrictions apply. When you need mealtime inspiration, it's worth Shopping Kroger, where you'll find over 30,000 mouth-watering choices that excite your inner foodie. And no matter what tasty choice you make, you'll enjoy our everyday low prices, plus extra ways to save, like digital coupons worth over $600 each week. You can also save up to $1 off per gallon at the pump with fuel points. More savings and more inspiring flavors make Shopping Kroger worth it every time. Kroger, fresh for everyone. Fuel restrictions apply.